We're going all the way back to the fall and winter of 1976 for this one. I know, I'm old. And granted, it's an old story, I promise you it's a good one. And in the summer of 76, my stupid self decided to move out to California. It was a well-meaning venture, I assure you, but a failed one in every conceivable aspect. I'd moved back to Arkansas less than a year after I moved out there. A place like home, I suppose. But it also might have had something to do with a roommate I had when I was living in Sacramento. I was kind of a latecomer to the hippie movement, too young for the summer of love or the Vietnam protests, but seeing what the war did to my old man was just awful. I was young, real young when he came back, but I remember how different he was, just like a little piece of him was lost over there somehow. So it wasn't until the mid 70s that I got a wild hair up my butt to move out to San Francisco. My old man said he'd give me a hundred dollars in bus money if I had stayed in high school long enough to graduate. So I did. And that same summer I headed out to San Fran on a Greyhound bus. Only I didn't quite make it. I stopped to see a guy I used to go to camp with in Sacramento and, well, just sort of stayed there. His parents offered me their spare room until I had enough money to carry on to Frisco, but living there made me feel like a bum. So. After squirreling away my first two paychecks, I decided to move into a shared apartment with two strangers. I meet up with a landlord at the house in question. We do a little walk around and he shows me where I'll be staying. The place was really nice. Three separate bedrooms, two bathrooms, then all the ground floor facilities you could imagine. Kitchen, laundry room, TV room, garage, and the rent was enticingly low considering it was such a nice place. Both guys who lived there were out of work at the time, so I didn't get to meet any of them in advance, and obviously I wasn't permitted to nosy around in either of their bedrooms, so I really didn't get a sense of their personalities. But boy, was that about to change fast. A week later, I moved into the free room and met the two guys I'd be living with. One guy was named Richard, and the other guy was named Brad. Richard seemed kind of weird and untidy, but... He seemed to mostly keep to himself, while Brad was much more friendly and outgoing. The thing was, Brad was moving out at some point over the following two weeks and he wanted to give me the skinny on Richard before he left. Basically he asked me how badly I needed the room. I told him real bad. It was either there or be homeless for the foreseeable future. And that's when he tells me that Richard can be cool when he wants to be, but he's definitely a few cards short of a full deck. I asked him what he means by that and he just replies, You'll see. Just keep your eye out for other apartments. The B generally has some good listings. At first I just figured I'd waded into some slightly bitter roommate rivalry or politics and I wanted nothing to do with it. I wasn't about to take sides after having been there for a grand total of five minutes. So I decided to play it diplomatically. But Brad was right. Richard was really weird and not even weird in a fun hippie way he wasn't just waving his freak flag hi man he was the freak flag all on his own first time i noticed was when i walked into the kitchen and richard was sat at the table reading a newspaper while holding an orange on top of his head i asked him what he was doing and he replied something like absorbing vitamin c i laughed thinking he was just being silly, but when I turned to look at him, deadpan, the guy was deadly serious. I start explaining that's not how nutrition works and he responds by telling me not to lecture him on what goes on in his body, how it was his body and he knew best about it. Naturally, I'm just like, okay, dude, whatever you say. Being as non-confrontational as possible, but the second I saw Brad, I conceded that he was right. Richard was crazy. Just how crazy, I had no idea. But I was sure about to find out. Richard's behavior remained curiously strange until the time that Brad moved out. It wasn't anything too scary, just stuff that made you roll your eyes or shake your head. Like at one point we're eating dinner in front of the TV and Richard kinda sits up, stares into space for a moment, checks his own pulse, then says, my heart just stopped beating. 
Brad seemed to have learned his lesson how to deal with such insane behavior because he falsely expresses some mild concern before suggesting Richard go take a nap. Which he then does. Like some hypochondriac child, he finished his dinner, then goes to take a nap to alleviate his... what? His dead heart? I have no idea. Like I said, it wasn't scary, just kind of annoying. All the scary stuff came after Brad moved out. In fact, I think Brad was the only thing keeping a lid on Richard's behavior, because the same day Brad leaves is the same day Richard took a turn for the worse. So, like I've mentioned, I was working part-time in Sacramento, working five-hour shifts four days a week over at a nearby grocery store. One day I get back from my shift and Richard is standing over the bathroom sink, looking into a piece of broken mirror he'd propped up against the counter, and he's shaving all his hair off with a straight razor. New haircut, buddy? I remember asking him. No, it's my skull. I think it's fractured. Well, better get down to the hospital, dicky boy. I hear those can be quite serious. I'd pretty much adopted Brad's approach wholesale by that point, kindly acknowledge and then disengage. But Richard responds by telling me that not only is his skull fractured, but that he can feel the plates moving around under his skin. No, I'm no doctor, but I was 99% sure that that was impossible. And when I took a look at his request, there was no bruising, no blood, nothing. He's just having another one of his hypochondriac health scares. One time we're having dinner and Richard dropped me a compliment on my sausage gravy. It was like a double compliment since it was my mom's secret recipe too. Turns out Brad was right. Richard could be nice when he wanted to be. But then he somehow managed to ruin the moment by saying something like, Yeah, you're a real good cook. Much better than my mom. She used to try and poison me. Again, like the thing with the orange, I thought he was cracking a joke, so I laughed. But just like the thing with the orange, he simply stares at me, totally straight-faced, and I realized that it wasn't a joke. Only this time, he's actually kind of offended that I didn't take him seriously. And that's the first time I saw Richard's mean side come out. He just stared at me, holding his knife and fork so hard his fists were shaking. And for a moment... I was actually scared he was just going to lunge at me from across the table. Instead, he picks up his plate, clears it, then marches off up to his room. A few hours later, he apologized for being so rude. I forgave him, and thus the cycle began anew. He'd act perfectly normal, then some weird outbursts would have me reconsidering Brad's suggestion keeping an eye out for a new apartment. But until I could get more hours at the Safeway, that just wasn't an option for me. If you remember, I moved into the apartment during the fall, and Richard's behavior had been, at worst, amusingly bizarre for the majority of my stay. But the closer and closer we got to Christmas, the more he seemed to be slipping further and further into some downward spiral, and it had turned out to be one he'd never fully recovered from, and it was definitely one that was made entirely worse for our use of recreational drugs. Like I said, late blooming hippie here, so when Richard suggested we get our hands on some pot and LSD, I just thought, groovy, you know? I didn't stop to consider that might be a terrible idea given his psychological issues. I actually kind of thought drugs might help him, but good lord did that turn out to be total naivety. Like I said, I thought a trip or two might help Richard out, give him a little perspective, but using drugs just spark some sort of fire in him. He didn't just use them recreationally like me and my buddies had back in Little Rock. He used them habitually. He tripped every night for a week until I literally had to hide the little eyedropper of acid I'd bought for us. And when he finally came out of it, he was all kinds of messed up. The day after he sobered up, I heard him coming down for breakfast. And when he walks into the kitchen area and I look up, I see he's as naked as the day he was born. Obviously, I'm like, screaming, Richard, put on some clothes for Christ's sake. He just responds with, why? Grabs some cereal, pours himself a bowl, and then just sits down to eat. 
I was just getting progressively, insanely more uncomfortable, and I couldn't bring myself to eat in front of a naked man like that, so I just got up and walked out. Huge mistake. Because I didn't properly address the whole nudity thing, he took that as him having a free pass. So, with an infuriatingly ever-increasing frequency, I'd have my roommate stumbling around the house, totally nude, while taking poles on a bottle of Jack Daniels. Now, most people I've told this story to, they have said that they'd have been gone the moment the nudity thing started. But what can I say? It was the 70s. I was something of a freak myself. And if I couldn't handle one little weirdo in Sacramento, how was I going to stomach rubbing shoulders with hardcore Frisco hippies once I made it out there? Nope. Instead, the final straw was coming home to find him making cocktails. So like I said, I walk into the house one day and I hear the blender in the kitchen whirring. I wait for the break in the whirring to call out to him as I walk into the TV room. He had to walk that way to get to the kitchen, asking him what he's making. He just replies, cocktails, in this dull, flat tone that let me know that he was wasted. But when I enter the kitchen, I get this strong odor of whiskey, along with something else. Following whatever he'd been doing, Richard had evidently made this very out-of-character attempt to clean up after himself, but he hadn't been completely thorough, as on the plain white countertop, I could still make out what looked like streaks of some thick red liquid. I walk over, run my finger over a patch of it, rubbing it together between my fingers before feeling that it has a distinctly sticky texture to it. Richard? I said. Is this blood? No, he replied. Suddenly I get this sudden urge to lift up the lid of the trash can, but at the same time, I'm also filled with dread. Whatever, or whoever that blood belonged to, there'd surely be remnants of it in the trash. In fact, upon seeing a small, bloody fingerprint on the trash can's lid, I'm sure that's where I'd find the remains. Then, of course, I open the trash to see a bloody paper bag with what was clearly a stripy raccoon tail sticking out of it. During the mother of all arguments that followed, when I asked him what in God's name he was doing, he tried to palm me off with an excuse I've never, ever forgotten. He briefly stops the blender from whirring and says, It's going to stop my heart from shrinking then carries on grinding up this reddy brown mess of soda, ice, and what I could only assume was raccoon meat. This crazy monster thought he had some rare medical condition where his heart was basically wasting away, and the cure was to blend the organ meats of trapped animals with Jack Daniels and Coca-Cola, of all things. Like I said, that was the final straw, and by that time, another guy was living there with us too. We discussed giving Richard a kind of ultimatum, either shape up or ship out. But considering he'd reached the butchering animals and eating them raw stage of his madness, we agreed the best thing was for us to just get out of there. I called my old camp buddy that night and begged my way back into his parents' spare room. I carried on working at the Safeway for a time, got some more hours, and since I wasn't paying rent in my buddy's parents' place, Getting some bus money and a security deposit was much easier. I didn't hear no more of Richard, and when I finally left San Francisco in January of 77, I never looked back. Cut to just over two years later, I think about March of 1979. I'm living back with my parents in Little Rock, and I've cleaned up my act, and I'm working at another grocery store with my mindset on applying to colleges. Sometimes I used to get up real early and head down to the grocery store at around 6.30 a.m. to help the owner prep for opening hours and a real small part of that was unpacking and arranging newspapers near the smaller front counter. I used to kind of take my time with this particular job on occasion, sipping my coffee, flicking through the sports section, all away from the prying eyes of the owner who was counting cash or whatever in his office. One morning... I catch a headline and I think was the National Enquirer, saying something like, Cannibal Killer's Trial Date Set. 
Obviously, that's not the sort of headline you read every day. So I start reading the article to get more details. And guess whose name I see? Just a few lines down. Yup. My insane, crazy old roommate, Richard Chase. There's even a little picture of him in the margin, and clear as day, it's him. Same guy I lived with for the better part of five months. This is all from memory, so you'd have to ask Google for all the details, but here's what I remember. After I left the home I shared with Richard, his condition worsened and worsened over the course of the year. Until finally in the winter of 77, he commits his first murder by randomly shooting a guy in the street. A few weeks later, he tries a home invasion, only the family isn't home, so he can't hurt anyone. So he decides to wait. But when they do get home, he gets the heebie-jeebies, turns tail, and runs. The family then arrives home to find that Richard had broken into their baby's nursery before going to the bathroom on the kid's clothes. He was absolutely sick in the head. A short time later, he tries another home invasion, and this time, he kills a pregnant woman. But here's the really messed up part. Before sleeping with her corpse, I read he put dog feces in the poor girl's mouth too. That makes you wonder what goes through a man's head to do something as absolutely insane as that. I followed the case for a while after and I was happy when I heard he got the death penalty for the things he did. He ended up taking his own life before they could get him to the gas chamber though. Figured he wanted to go out on his own terms. Only thing that messes with me is that some people say he wasn't crazy. That he knew what he was doing when he killed those women and did those awful things to them. I'm not saying he didn't deserve to die. That's not what I'm saying at all. Heck, I'd even kick the chair out from under that guy in a hot minute if he gave me the chance. But the only thing that's crazy is saying that he ain't. You understand me? I lived with that man. I ate with him. I tripped with him. I know Richard Chase. And the cheese slid off that boy's crackers a long time before he started killing. He was crazy as a dog in a hubcap factory the whole time I knew him. And although what he did was a tragedy, I was entirely surprised by it. I feel lucky to have gotten out when I did. Hang around for another year and it might have been me getting shot dead at the side of the road. But the thing that really sticks with me isn't the survivor guilt, or whatever people want to call it. It's wondering how evil like that even comes into this world. I used to live with the biggest idiot on the face of the earth. Hector was the six-foot Afro-Latino dude from New Jersey who had two distinct modes of being. Either he was a tornado of anger, or he was manically laughing at something. Rarely was there any in between. When you caught him in his laughing mood, he was tolerable at best. But catch him in one of his angry moods, and he was totally unbearable. He was a roadie for some post-hardcore band that toured up and down the East Coast a bunch, which was one of the few good things about being his roommate. The fact that he spent weeks away at a time from the apartment, but still paid rent. But whenever he was home, well, here's an example. It's July in East Harlem. I have the windows open. Latin brass band music is flowing through the afternoon air from some other open window, and I'm sipping southern peach lemonade like life is good. Out of nowhere, Hector bursts into the apartment, covered in brick dust, like, I need bricks, bro. You got bricks? I just started driving Uber while trying to get my stand-up career up and running, so no, I didn't have any bricks. And even if I did, I wouldn't have been sharing them with Hector. And suddenly he's like, there's bricks on the roof. And as he runs out of the apartment and towards the stairwell of the building, I hear these kids shouting from outside the window. Then I look out to see this group of kids, like 11 year old kids all shouting stuff in Spanish at our building. They see me, start flipping me off and whatnot before they suddenly scatter in all directions. Then bam, a brick lands right in the spot where they were before they scattered. See, that's the type of guy Hector was. 
he can go out for a pack of rips and find himself in a brick fight with a bunch of Puerto Rican kids on the way back. Never in my life have I ever had a fight with a preteen, let alone one involving projectiles. But around Hector, that stuff was like a daily occurrence. So come that October, Hector is headed out on some big Halloween tour with one of his bands and he tells me he won't be back till the second week of November. That meant I'd have to cover half of the rent until then, something I'd have to borrow money to do. This causes a big fight and for the first time since I moved in, I thought Hector might actually hit me. And being the kind of guy that he was, I knew for a fact that if it came to violence, he wouldn't just stop at one punch. So when the time came for him to go on tour, the mood in the apartment isn't just at its low point. I'm legit scared for my physical safety. He leaves, I'm looking for a new apartment and life is not so good anymore. So a few nights later, the night before Halloween actually, I'm sitting in the little kitchen area, eating my repas and looking for other apartments. Someone buzzes the apartment so I go to see who it is. This is back when we had intercoms but they sucked and barely worked half the time so when I hear some guy with an accent says something like, I need an apartment number three, but the buzzer's not working. I just buzz the guy in without a second thought. New York is a city built on takeout, delivery, and street food, so I'm hardly going to be all suspicious over a delivery driver. But I should have been, and I almost paid with my life for it. Those guys busted our front door open like it was nothing, just smashed the lock right through with a sledgehammer. I actually thought it was the cops at first because they just piled in, guns drawn, shouting get on the floor, get down. But then the way that they were talking to each other once I was lying face down on the linoleum, that clued me into the fact that they were just stick up guys. But what were they doing in my apartment? My first thought was, Jesus Christ Hector, whose toes did you step on now? But before I can wonder anymore, one of the guys starts asking me, where is it? Where is it? I'm like, where's what? But that just makes them mad. I get this flurry of kicks that have me balled up in the fetal position, then they ask me again. I can't tell them anything else, so I just say, I, I don't know what you're talking about, there's $20 in my wallet, that's all I got on me. The offer of 20 bucks just offended them, and I get more kicks before they start tossing the apartment like they're looking for something. And when I say tossing, I really do mean trashing. They're deliberately breaking stuff, rolling drawers all the way out and then throwing them at other stuff. It was just destruction in every sense of the word and it was around then that I got a look at a couple of the guys. They're all messed up or have stuff over their faces. They're wearing all black, gloves and the works. They were professional stick-up guys, probably robbed drug dealers for a living, but Hector wasn't dealing. I mean, I think I'd have noticed at some point. I saw a lot of broken guitars and amplifiers around the apartment, but not too many piles of coke or money. Then right as I'm about to think it, one of the guys comes out with it. You sure this is the right place, man? Uh, I don't know. Only told me he keeps it behind the bathtub sometimes. These people only got a shower in there. I feel this wave of relief washing over me. They got the wrong place, so... They're going to just walk out, right? Maybe take my phone so I can't call the cops. So, like I said, I told them my phone was on the table, next to my food, and that I wouldn't call the cops if they just left. Cuck move, maybe, but it's amazing how zen you get about material possessions when you see a Glock in someone's hand. The stick-up guys kind of pause and look at each other. Then right as I think they're about to just leave, one of them says... I think you see my face, man, when we were breaking in. You've got to go. One of them has the gun, and the guy who wants me dead starts reaching to take it off the guy who has it. But the guy who has it doesn't want to give it up. That was my cue to soil myself and start begging for my life. It wasn't my proudest moment, and being my pants was by no means metaphorical. But it is what it is, looking back. They're arguing over shooting me. I'm begging for my life. It's just chaos and them shouting in there and... And I'm amazed no one had called the cops already. But then boom. The front entrance of the apartment building slammed shut. 
and I can hear a very familiar voice coming up the stairs. I'm not even going to type out what Hector was saying. I'd be cancelled and deleted from the internet within seconds after posting, but let's just say someone had cancelled their tour three days in, and he was livid about it. Going on, calling them every name under the sun, ranting and raving as he pound his way up the stairs and in the apartment, both me and the stick-up guys are about frozen in anticipation. Then right as Hector is about to come into the apartment, he says something like, Hey, I got your money, you whiny little baby. What the f***? The guy with the gun aims it at Hector as he walks in, looking around at the pure destruction that greeted him. Who are you people? He screamed. Who are you? The guy with the gun screamed back. Hector is just gone by this point, foaming at the mouth, looking like he's got one of his eyeballs about to pop when he comes back. I live here! Then, I swear to God, I watch as Hector basically turns into a drunk, slightly overweight Jason Bourne. He swings his backpack off his shoulder and just launches it at the shooter. He knocks the guy slightly off balance, messes up his aim, but by the time he can like rearrange himself, Hector, like football, tackles this guy onto the carpet and just starts wailing on him. The two other guys then jump in and I'm thinking, Oh Jesus God, someone's about to get shot. When out of nowhere, Hector comes up and is just windmailing punches at both guys, holding his own until he goes down again. Then almost immediately, both guys start backing up, hands in the air, and there's Hector, holding the gun he'd almost just been shot with telling both the guys to back up. His face is bleeding. He's totally gassed, but there he is, having just won a freaking fist fight with three guys, one of them armed. He then sits on the KO'd shooter's back, tells the other guys to get out of his apartment, and tells me to dial 911. And only when the cops show up to arrest the guy he'd managed to detain did he realize he'd been stabbed in the shoulder. That night, as he got stitched up at the hospital, I sifted through all the broken and non-broken stuff, swept up all the broken glass and ceramics, and generally tried to put the apartment back in order. He got back at around 1am, still drunk after the doctor told him, do not drink on these painkillers, and he immediately started complaining about the break-in. I just carried on cleaning up, stopping only briefly to say something deeply heartfelt. Hector, dude. I just wanted to say I think you might have saved my life today, dude. And I just want to say thank you. I felt my throat kind of tighten as I said it. Very similar to the way it's doing now as I'm typing this, remembering. Hector looked up at me, with this look in his eyes that almost made it look like I'd gotten through to him, until he replied with, Whatever, you could have jumped in at any time. Ah, I didn't mind. I knew Hector well enough by that point to know he wasn't exactly in touch with his feelings. But as he immediately sought to leave the room due to the uncomfortable amount of emotion in the air, he turned and said, Did you see the look on those guys' faces, though? This hilarious, dude. And he just walked off to his bedroom, laughing that evil toddler laugh that makes my skin crawl, even today. You see... For just over a year, I shared an apartment with the biggest idiot on the face of the earth. And I owe that idiot my life. Please, New York, don't ever change. Back when I was a sophomore in college, I had this weird, uber-shifty Armenian roommate called Tigran. He gave off the strongest serial killer vibes ever. He was a weird loner type unhealthy obsession with all things lewd, kept a knife collection for some reason, uh, like I was considering asking for a dorm transfer almost as soon as I met the guy. But then I move in, a few months go by, and he just sort of keeps to himself. So in the end, it wasn't all that bad, and I didn't seek the transfer. Then one night, I just so happened to be watching the evening news when I catch a story about a series of attacks targeting girls on campus. Obviously, with it being so close to home, it piques my interest and I start paying attention. That's when they show a sketch artist drawings of the suspected attacker, and the guy they show on screen looks almost exactly like Tigran. Same dark hair and eyes, the same sloping brow and wide features. 
I mean, it was like a Snapchat filter sketch rendering of his face, almost identical. Immediately, I'm like, no way. He can't actually be the one. Because him being a serial killer was just a running joke. He couldn't actually have been one. But then again, he did stay late at the library most nights. And if he wasn't at the library, he was night jogging, as he put it. I never heard of anyone running in the dark before in my life, so as you can imagine, I get this horrible twinge of fear in my gut that Tigran was actually the one attacking these girls. Only, and I know this might sound dumb, but I didn't want to just pick up the phone and call 911 on the guy just because he was a night owl who looked similar to a sketch. I mean, what if it turned out to be a totally different dude, and I end up ruining Tigran's academic year by embroiling him in some kind of nightmare false accusation. So, I decided to wait it out. Keep a close eye on him, and if he carried on with his sketchy nocturnal pursuits, or if there was another attack, then I'd call the campus cop's tip line and leave an anonymous message. About a week goes by. It's like coming up on 10 p.m. and Tikran gets home late from wherever he's been. I casually drop a little question in there like, How's it been? Been busy? Where'd you just get back from? Then right as he's about to answer, I notice all these red marks up and down his arm. I feign a bathroom visit to get a little look at them, and I can clearly see what look like scratches up and down his forearms. I'm in the bathroom like, oh god. Oh god, he's got those scratches from a victim. Classic defense wounds, and I bet I'll hear about it tomorrow on the news. Then when I'm casually like, oh whoa buddy, those scratches look nasty, how'd you get them? He replies that he just started taking MMA lessons. MMA lessons? Not jujitsu or strike training or BJJ, just a super vague excuse of MMA lessons. After that, I'm almost 100% convinced it's him attacking girls around campus. Only I can't risk telling on him and him not catching any charges, as I got it in my head that he'd like know it was me or something. So. I hatched the dumbest plan ever to follow him at night and catch him in the act. I really did. That way, in my mind at least, I could potentially catch him red-handed, maybe stop it and tackle him, and basically sit on the guy until the cops showed up, having saved the day with zero repercussions from a psychopath a serial killer roommate. Then maybe like two or three nights later, I hear Tigran grabbing his keys in preparation to leave. I say, where you headed to, bud? And he replies, Just going running? I'll be back late. I just shrug it off, barely looking up from playing Xbox. But when he shuts the door, I sprint into action, throwing on khakis, boots, hoodie, the works, before grabbing my phone for the purposes of gathering evidence. As soon as I see that Tigran, despite being dressed for athletics, is actually just walking to wherever he's going, I'm convinced I'm about to maybe save a life, at least stop a girl from being hideously violated in a way she might never truly recover from. I mean, why else would that guy lie about jogging at night? It was kind of like a spy movie for a while in my mind. Me tailing Tigran, staying far enough away that he wouldn't suspect anything but also working my butt off to make sure I didn't just lose track of him. We ended up walking way off campus through a residential area and towards a large public park. And as we get closer and closer to this big clump of bushes, Tigran takes something out of his pocket and slides it over his head. A ski mask. I hadn't been all that scared until I saw that, and something about seeing him slipping on the mask of his predatory alter ego. God, that about scared the living crap out of me. It was like the closest I'll ever come to seeing a legit werewolf transformation or something actually witnessing a monster being born, or however you want to phrase it. Then, with me slightly out of sight, I watched Tigran walk into the clump of bushes. It had to be his ambush spot of choice, right? A place he'd wait and watch for potential victims to come along before pouncing on them. It had to be enough. I'd creep into the bushes, rip off his ski mask, all while recording a video so I can get definitive proof that it's him committing the acts. So, I start slowly creeping towards the bushes through the darkness when I decide what I'm doing is a really, really bad idea. 
If Tigran really is some violent attacker, maybe me cornering him in a bush isn't the smartest move. So I decide to call the cops before I make my move. And that way, I won't be waiting too long for them to show up when I finally do tackle him. So I call, tell them the situation, and although the dispatcher tells me not to approach the suspect, I'm so nervous about the prospect of Tigran getting away and then forced to carry on living with him that I think, screw it, I'm going to nail this guy. I wasn't about to let him get away once he saw flashing lights or something. Then right as I have that exact thought, I start hearing the sound of hushed voices and grunting coming from the bushes where Tigran was hiding. He had someone. Somehow in that time it had taken me to make the 911 call. I had to pull back a little so no one would spot my cell phone light or hear my voice. He had managed to drag someone into the bushes, and he had already started an attack. At that, I launched into action, rushing towards the bushes and shouting something like, Hey, leave her alone. It's dark, but since I'm recording, my phone flashlight is lighting up everything I'm pointing at. So, as I push my way into this little clearing, I see not one, but two guys scatter before turning to face me. My adrenaline goes into overdrive at that moment. I had no idea that I'd be outnumbered and that Tigran had been working as part of a team. So my first thought is like, oh god, I knew this was a bad idea. But still, both guys seem severely caught off guard, and as I start recording faces and reaching for Tigran's ski mask, the other, who wasn't wearing a mask, bolts out of the bushes and flees the scene. Tigran can't go anywhere though. His pants are by his ankles, and as he reaches for them, I shoved him to the floor and told him to stay put. And that's about the time I start to notice the distinct lack of any female victim. I'm shining my light around and I'm on the verge of being like, hello, where's the victim? When the thought hits me like a ton of bricks, there was no female victim and there never was a victim at all. The only people who had been in that bush were Tigran and his male companion. He hadn't been going out to attack girls. He'd been going out for secret meetups with dudes he's been meeting on Grinder. Who knows why the guy in the sketch looks so much like him. Maybe someone had spotted him on his way to or from one of his meetings, then passed his description on to the cops. Either way, not only did they never find the guy who was actually to blame, but Tigran obviously wasn't the one attacking these girls. I mean, he wasn't even into girls. I had to convince the dispatcher that the perpetrators I thought I had caught had gotten away, in which during that time, Tigran did have time to separate himself from that situation, probably went back to the dorm. And without a victim, by the time police showed up, they chalked it up to me just being an overly concerned citizen. They took my muddied up statement and annoyedly told me to be safe and get on with my evening. I ended up apologizing profusely to Tigran, who actually thought I was just some homophobe at first. But once I showed him the composite sketch and explained my hunch, he was willing to forgive me on the condition that I keep his secret. You see, Tigran wasn't just ethnically Armenian. He was actually born there, and since his family were hardcore religious, they wouldn't approve of his lifestyle at all, hence why he kept it under wraps. We were all square, but living with him was still pretty awkward, and it wasn't like we became the best of friends afterward. But still, definitely one of the scariest things I've experienced with a college roommate. And from now on, I'll just mind my own business. For my senior year of college, I lived off campus for a number of different reasons. A, it was a lot cheaper than dorms. B, my apartment was just two blocks away from my part-time job. And C, topper. What's a topper, I can probably hear you asking right now. But the question is not so much what topper is, but who topper is. Topper is purely a nickname, by the way. And if it wasn't for the fact that he was masquerading as a normal person somewhere with a cushy job and a young family, I'd call him by his real name. But I don't want to get him in trouble because whether or not his wife knows it, 
Topper used to have a pretty wild past. Half the reason I ended moving in with Topper was his psychonautical shenanigans, a fancy term we used to refer to as insatiable hunger for narcotics. I was a poor senior with just enough cash to buy ramen and printer paper, whereas Topper had an actual job as a sound engineer. In a city like Seattle, you're never out of work if you can handle a mixer and detangle a web of cables. Topper could do both, and what's more, he was just a great guy. He was crazy as a crack house rat, but still, he was just about as warm and generous a person as you would ever likely meet. Me and Topper smoked a lot, and I was way too nervous about taking acid or shrooms in what was still a brand new apartment for me. It took me a few months, but when the time came, I told him I was ready for my first LSD experience. I figured that would involve me, him, maybe a third party in the form of a mutual friend of ours. But no, Topper decides to throw what he called a peyote party, where he and a bunch of his friends, me included, would all trip balls together. I was totally reluctant at first, as I heard you should be comfortable and familiar with your surroundings and your companions while doing hallucinogenic drugs. But on the night in question, Topper said we'd be spending a few hours talking, snacking, and generally getting comfortable with one another before we dose. That way, if I had any second thoughts when the time came, I could sit it out and just wait for another occasion. There was zero pressure like that with Topper. If he dosed, he loved you. If he didn't, he loved you. Just don't eat all those cheese doodles and it's all good, you know? Like I said, peyote party commences and our tiny apartment is filled with either strangers or people I hardly know at all. But over the course of about two or three hours, I make some friends, have some cool conversation, soak up the compliments that followed, who made this guacamole? A good time was had by all. So when Topper taps a teaspoon against an empty wine glass and says in a silly French accent, Ladies and gentlemen, dinner is served. Before unveiling a plate of acid-soaked blotting paper, I was like, screw it, I'm in. So I take my little piece of blotter paper. Topper had made me my own special piece with only a half dose for the newbie. Let it kind of dissolve into mush on my tongue, then I swallow it. And for like the first hour or so that followed, I didn't feel a thing. Then like 90 minutes in, I think I ate too much hummus, I finally start to feel it. Or rather, feel it is not the right term. I started seeing these lines in my vision little blurry lines that were hardly even detectable. But they are there, plain as day. Not long after, things started to go very, very wrong. Despite having once been super comfortable with all these new people, once I got this who are these people and why are they here thought in my head, things started falling apart and I was headed into one heck of a bad trip. After a while of trying to keep calm, I ended up running down the hall to our bathroom and puking up this disgusting mess of hummus and pita bread. But at the time, puking just made things worse. Like I was convinced that I was about to puke up my stomach, my heart, my lungs. But the more I tried not to puke, the more I puked. And by the time I had this was a bad idea rattling around my head, it looked like there was no going back. Then. This is what happened following me locking myself in the bathroom. I hear a knock on the door and someone saying like, You gotta come out, bud. Can't stay in there forever. I know they're right, so I unlock the door. And I'm greeted by this woman in her 50s who starts asking me if I'm okay. I didn't remember talking to her when I was sober, but the apartment was full of people coming and going, so I didn't think anything more of it. She asked me like, Bad trip? to which I just nod. So she offers me her hand and she leads me into my bedroom. I remember going to turn the light on, but she stopped me. I guess that would have been too much stimulation and just rolls me in the bed before tucking me in. She fetches me a glass of water, tells me to drink as much as I can and says something like, you have to be strong. This isn't gonna last forever. We have to be strong and you have that strength in you. So make me proud. 
she put on super soothing music on my iPod dock and just left me there to ride out the bad trip. I remember not feeling as bad for a while after. And then there's a big gap in my memory because the next thing I remember, I was waking up and it was morning. I felt weird, really weird, like spaced out and ravenously hungry. So I walked into our little kitchenette and stuffing Captain Crunch into my face like it's the last box on earth. Most of the party goers had gone. There was just two remainders lying comatose on our couch, so I keep extra quiet until Topper stumbles into the room like, Crazy night, huh? Sorry about your bad trip. I respond, That's okay. That friend of yours, the older lady, she helped me feel tons better. He says, Who? So I start describing her, trying to remember what she was wearing. It's all coming back in patchy, fuzzy frames, so I'm just describing as I go. Again, he's like, Dude, I have no idea who you're talking about. There was no one at that party over the age of 28, so unless someone wandered into the apartment and just so happened to guess you were tripping in the bathroom, and that's when it hit me. There was no older lady. I'd hallucinated the entire thing. I was so messed up that I invented a person to help me out, to tell me what I needed to hear. And as cool as that was, realizing it was one of the freakiest moments of my life. It seemed so real. Too real. Like I saw those weird lines too, but I didn't get into my head that someone had redecorated the apartment. So what was it about the woman that seemed so real? It took me a while, but I worked it out. I totally made this woman up, but she was talking with my mom's voice. That line about being strong, making her proud. She said those exact things to me when I broke my ankle on a skiing trip in ninth grade. I know this isn't the most traditional scary story, though ghosts or zombies or psycho killers with hooks for hands, but never in my life have I ever, ever so vividly believed in something that just didn't exist. And it's actually kind of scary how powerful our brains are. Take a dose of one special chemical and boom, moving sound and picture show, right there in your head, using random pieces of information you thought you'd long since forgotten about. I haven't done anything like that since. The whole negative experience just put me off for life. I think that's the closest I'll ever get to, like, seeing the ghost, if that makes sense. I legitimately saw something that seemed so real, but it was totally fake. And that's just about enough for one lifetime, if you ask me. After I had moved to London, the first flatmate I had legitimately tried to kill me. I think he was only keen for me to move in so I could cover all the rent he was missing. And after a while, petty arguments about cleanliness and money management turned rather vicious, and I was forced to find a new place to live. Once I found a place, I had to wait two weeks to move in, and although this definitely wasn't the right move, I thought I'd have to leave it until the last minute to tell my stupid flatmate because, screw you, that's why. And instead of waiting until the day before, I ended up dropping that little tidbit into an argument we had about a week before I was due to move out. He started playing the victim, telling me I was basically condemning him to being homeless, but if it wasn't for his silver spoon up the butt attitude to work, I might have had a bit more sympathy for him. We both smoked and did so in the flat, so the morning after our argument I wake, roll over and grab my smokes to light one up in bed before facing the day. Not my proudest habit. I hold my hands up, but smoking in my room was better than facing him in the morning. I pop a ciggy between my lips, grab my lighter, but the bloody flint on the disposable piece of crap is bust. I try time and time again, but nope, it's buggered. So I roll out of bed, walk down the hall towards the kitchen, still trying hopelessly to get a light. Then suddenly, as I stroll into the kitchen, the absolute reek of gas hits me, and just under the humming of traffic outside, I can hear gas leaking out of the stove top. That freaking psychopath had turned on all the gas in the kitchen, knowing I'd have sparked up first thing, blowing the whole flat sky high. I rushed to turn them off, open all the windows in the flat, ran downstairs and called the fire brigade. My flatmate was interviewed under caution 
but because they couldn't prove a bloody thing, the police had to let him walk. The landlord was much more understanding though, and we basically made an agreement to cut him out of the lease while we arranged for locks to be changed. Apparently, he'd been looking to get rid of him for quite a while before the incident, so I ended up staying put. The only worry was the ex-flatmate, but since he was under suspicion over what he must have called an accident, I think he was too scared to follow up on it and try for any serious revenge. Still, mess with my head for quite a while after, thinking someone would be that vindictive over me just wanting to move out. Do your research on who you're going to be living with people that might just save your life.